So Dennis is recording me, and I, I was going to read him this article that I found about um, why your cosmetics don't have to be tested for safety, which was published on December 16th, 2019 um, by PBS NewsHour. And I, as soon as I started reading it, I realized that I need to share it with, with you guys too. Um, and I can just put the link in the description, so if you don't feel like listening to me read it, if you prefer to just read it yourself, you can just go to that link and um, discontinue watching this video. Okay, so before you head out the door each morning, you probably use cosmetic products like shampoo, deodorant, and toothpaste. But the regulations that guarantee the safety of those products in the United States haven't been updated since 1938. That's when Congress ushered in the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Legislation that brought cosmetics, among other products, under the authority of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Whether and how to update the agency's approach to cosmetic safety is now being considered by the U.S. House Subcommittee on Health. According to testimony from a December 4th hearing, the FDA believes most cosmetic products that are bought and sold in the United States are safe to use, said Susan Main, director of the agency's Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. Skin moisturizers, perfumes, fingernail polish, makeup, and hair treatments all fall under this category. We don't know whether cosmetic ingredients have gone through adequate, if any, safety testing, said Susan Main, director of the agency's Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. Legally, companies cannot sell harmful products or misbrand their cosmetics. However, with the exception of color additives, cosmetics and their ingredients are not subject to pre-market approval requirements or FDA safety review, Maine said to House lawmakers. Therefore, we don't know whether cosmetic ingredients have gone through adequate, if any, safety testing. Manufacturers are not required to register products or list their ingredients with the FDA before putting them on the market. About a third of those companies have voluntarily registered with a database the agency hosts to keep track of cosmetic products that are commercially distributed in the U.S. In the European Union, cosmetic products must undergo an expert scientific safety assessment before they can be sold to consumers. Under current rules in the U.S., the FDA can only act on a product that shows evidence of harm after it's been introduced to the market. While the EU has prohibited the use of 1,378 substances in cosmetic products, the United States has banned or restricted 11 such ingredients. Even if the FDA identifies a safety issue with a cosmetic, it can't force manufacturers to take that product off the shelf. Any recall issued by the agency is voluntary. If a company refuses to comply with a recall, the agency can instead put out a safety advisory informing consumers about any health concerns associated with the product. On average, 396 cosmetic-related individual health problems or adverse events were submitted per year to the FDA between 2004 and 2016, though in 2016, the agency received 1,591 reports, a 300% increase that was largely driven by complaints regarding hair care products. Representatives Frank Pallone, Democrat, New Jersey, and Jan Schakowsky, Democrat, Illinois, have respectively drafted and introduced two pieces of legislation that would expand the FDA's authority to regulate cosmetics. We need to contact them. <laughs> One of those bills would ban toxic ingredients in cosmetics and specifically protect salon workers and women of color populations that the bill considers particularly vulnerable when it comes to cosmetic exposure. Here's why the House is push pushing these policies now and how they could patch regulatory gaps that might currently be harming consumers. How cos this is a new section. How cosmetics policy can influence human health. The adverse events reported by consumers to the FDA range from mild situations such as rashes to more severe problems. Maine testified that approximately 30% of the adverse events are classified as more serious or severe, while the remaining 70% are mild. During the hearing, several lawmakers raised the issue of endocrine disrupting chemicals, which may be found in consumer products, including cosmetics. As the name suggests, these chemicals can interfere with the bodily systems and glands that regulate human hormones. We also know that some endocrine disrupting chemicals can interfere with testosterone, 
They can interfere with other types of hormones, thyroid hormone, insulin. Andrea Gore, a neuroendocrinologist at the University of Texas at Austin, told the PBS News Hour. Many endocrine disruptors work by physically resembling the chemical and three-dimensional structures of natural hormones, Gore said. Your body can absorb these disruptors if you apply them to your skin or wash your hair with them. When endocrine disruptors are absorbed into the body, Gore explained, they can circulate similarly to the way hormones do. If one makes its way to a hormone receptor, it can potentially block it can potentially activate a bodily response or block that receptor entirely. One potential group of disruptors are called phthalates. According to the FDA, various phthalates are used in products ranging from vinyl flooring to food packaging to personal care products. Diethyl phthalate, DEP, a solvent and fixative in fragrances, is the only phthalate still regularly used in cosmetics. Human studies, as reviewed in JAMA Pediatrics, have linked phthalates to decreases in sex steroid and thyroid hormone levels, poor sperm quality, endometriosis, insulin resistance, obesity, and possibly breast cancer. Metabolites of two phthalates, di diisobutyl phthalate, or DIP, DIBP, DIBP, and dibutyl phthalate, DBP, meta metabolates, the latter of which was historically used in products like nail polish, have been associated with increases, increased chances of preterm birth. During her questioning of Maine, Republican Robin, sorry, Representative Robin Kelly, Democrat, Illinois, brought up data suggesting that women of color are more exposed to certain endocrine disrupting chemicals compared to white women. That's because women of color have to use much stronger chemicals trying to alter their texture to look more like a white woman's texture and trying to, um, they have stronger hair too. So it's a little bit more challenging to color sometimes. And that means you need stronger chemicals to get the oxidative processes going. It's not because of the color of their skin. It's because of the chemicals they have to use to achieve what they're trying to achieve because of their hair type. Just saying. A 2011 study that examined a potential association between childhood hair product use and menarche, or the onset of, or the onset of menstruation, found that African Americans were more likely to use hair products and reached menarche earlier than other racial ethnic groups. The study concluded that hair oil and perm use during childhood was associated with earlier menarche. Early menarche has been linked to an increased risk of developing breast cancer later on in life. Um, so saying, I just want to add, saying just hair oil is very vague. If it's a product that's got chemicals in it that's called an oil, that would maybe make sense. But if it's just oil, natural oils, I'm not sure they're saying that just natural, completely natural oils are leading to this. Um, onset of menstruation, menstruation and breast cancer. It just says hair oil. That's very vague. Um, but perm, that would be permanent straightening of the hair using um, highly alkaline chemicals. The insatiable appetite for profit in the cosmetic industry, bolstered often by fantastical, narrow notions of beauty, has have targeted black women. M. Isabel Chaudhry, a senior policy manager at the National Women's Health Network, testified. This combination is dangerous and it impacts the health of black women, Afro-descendant women, as well as poor women and other women of color, causing reproductive health issues, cancer, and even death. In her written testimony, Chaudhry cited a 2017 report that highlighted how colorism, hair texture preferences, and odor discrimination can be linked to specific hazardous products used by women of color. According to the FDA, most companies are responsible actors who care about consumer safety and the reputation of their brands, Maine testified. But she noted that when a safety problem occurs, the FDA is not always able to compel companies to provide all of the information it requests during an investigation. Along those lines, if a consumer experiences an adverse event with a product and reports it to a company, the manufacturers aren't required to disclose those incidents to the FDA. Maine pointed out that the FDA does not have information about potential long-term safety risks associated with cosmetic use because that data isn't processed through the reporting system, which is designed to handle more short-term consumer health outcomes. Okay, almost done, guys. One more little section. Question, will Congress modernize cosmetic safety? 
The Cosmetic Safety Enhancement Act of 2019, a bill drafted by Pallone, would allow the FDA to issue mandatory product recalls, require manufacturers to notify the agency of reported adverse events, and provide additional funding to carry out these changes. It would also compel manufacturers to register the ingredients used in their cosmetics and require importers to verify the safety of their products in compliance with the FDA's cosmetic good manufacturing practices. The Safe Cosmetics and Personal Care Products Act of 2019, proposed by Schakowsky, would mandate that manufacturers list all of the ingredients used in their products, including those that fall under the category of fragrance, which are currently exempt from disclosure, among other prov provisions. Several Republican lawmakers voiced concerns about the proposed changes to FDA oversight. Representative Michael Burgess, Republican Texas, said that the legislation did not adequately address the issue of harmonization between federal and state law when it comes to regulation. He emphasized that any law passed on this issue should establish that national law is superior to state law. In 2005, California passed the California Safe Cosmetics Act, which mandates that companies disclose ingredients in their products that are known or suspected to cause cancer, birth defects, or other types of reproductive harm. That makes cos California's cosmetic regulation standards stronger than those at the federal level. Burgess also noted that the legislation didn't exempt small businesses from proposed new FDA registration requirements, a point echoed by Leo O'Donnell, executive director of the Handcrafted Soap and Cosmetic Guild. She testified that her organization did not support mandated ingredient reporting for small businesses with annual gross sales of less than $1 million, explaining that such companies would struggle to comply with those requirements, meaning that they wouldn't have enough money to fund their own safety testing. Um, we should strive to enact legislation that provides the agency with the tools necessary to protect the public health, said Representative Greg Walden, Republican Oregon, while being careful not to overregulate an industry that has generally posed relatively minimal risk to human health. So I have been trying to figure out whether those I need to figure out whether those two acts got passed because that would be really important if the FDA is able to actually force a recall now. That would be a major um, step in the right direction and uh, would give me more motivation to continue trying to reach uh, the FDA and get their help with investigating DivaCurl. Um, I want to add that this is also part of the reason why I've chosen to use a brand that it was is Dennis and I have chosen to only use a brand that's completely um, manufactured and created in Italy, where they do have those extremely high um, safety standards and actual regulation. Uh, and it's also fragrance and colorant free, uh, synthetic fragrance and colorant free. Uh, and, you know, this is very scary information. It's very sad because as it reads, our cosmetics are absorbed into our body through our skin. Um, your hair is not living, it's not a living part of your body, so your products do need to actually touch your scalp, which is part of your skin, to be absorbed or touch your hands, right? If you're probably applying things with your hands, it can also absorb through your hands. Um, you can also inhale fumes from products as well. So those are all methods of consumption, and that's why um, cosmetics do fall in, under regulation by the FDA. They're just not treated the way that um, drugs and the way that drugs and um, food are. But I do want to mention that they have been issuing a lot of recalls of hand sanitizers, which is a perfect example of how dangerous it is to put something toxic on your skin because these are potentially deadly hand sanitizers. People aren't drinking them necessarily. They're just putting it on their skin. Um, so it's a big problem, and I really hope that someday um, I can be a power player in the movement to continue to increase regulation of um, cosmetics and just consumer protection period that's sort of a larger mission that dennis and i are going to start talking more about um and he's agreed to you know be part of that and support that and i really appreciate you baby um it's a big uh it's a big mission because there's a lot of money and power and politics in uh, regulation and and uh, you know processing and packaging and safety and all of that. 
but I think that you know, we're young and we've got a lot of energy to to continue trying to have a greater impact on the world and really make a lasting impact and, and help really save lives and protect people, you know, save lives by increasing protection. It's really important. So um, I hope you guys enjoyed learning about this and that you'll do more of your own research and, and join me in trying to uh, get more protection and I'll keep you guys updated on what I'm doing and if I can use your help. I love you so much. You can follow me on Instagram at Steph.Marrow and have a great rest of your day.